All right, we're going to turn our attention down to Acts 27. We're going to try to get through as much of the chapter as possible. I'm not going to ask you to stand and read it. This is a boat story. This is a boat story. I'm so psyched. I love boat stories. In fact, uh, to research and prepare and to get into character, I spent the whole day on my boat yesterday just to, like, focus and be ready. I mean, I take my job very seriously. I'm very much into this. All right, so let's get started. This is a great boat story, and towards the end, I think you'll see that, that the Lord's really going to speak through this in a way that can be an encouragement to you this morning, but we're just going to deal with the story. So it begins with Acts 27, 1 through 2, and when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, this is Luke writing. He's talking about Paul, who's been a prisoner. He's appealed to Caesar, so they're going to go to see Caesar in Italy, um, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius and embarking in a ship of Adramidium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. All right. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at a map, so let's throw it up there. And uh, I've got my trusty pointer. Map. Here we are, down here in... Uh, Caesarea Maritime, this was the main port for the Palestinian region. And the goal is to get way up there. All right, that's a long journey, no matter how you look at it. And they're bordering uh, this ship from Adramidia, however you say that. And that's up here. So that's where that ship is, is eventually bound for. And their plan is to get up here into uh, Lycia and swap ships and then try to get over to, to Italy. All right, that's the plan. And, of course, uh, Luke is traveling. Aristarchus, who is a fellow prisoner with, with uh, Paul, is also traveling there. And so let's see what happens next. Verse 3. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And then putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra and Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. Uh, we sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Snidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salome, coasting along it with difficulty. We came to a place called Fair Havens near which was the city of Lycia. All right. Now I know you're like, boring. This is not boring. This is a travel narrative. There's stuff happening all along. Let me just show you a couple things. All right. Back to the map. Okay, first stop, a mere 60 miles to Sidon. Uh, you know, all that pomp, and then, you know, you sit here probably for about a week waiting for them to load, unload, do commerce. This is a commerce ship. And so, but Julius, this uh, Roman cohort, you know, Paul just finds favor with him, and he says, you, you can go hang out with your friends. You know, I mean, Paul basically volunteered to go see <laughs> the emperor. Uh, there's still really no charges that sticking against him. He's treated like a prisoner, but... A uh, very esteemed prisoner. All right, go back up there for just a second. Okay, so now uh, they stay there, and then he says they set out from Sidon, but the winds were against them, which means they're coming westerly, northwesterly. He's trying to get up, well, to here, and they, the winds are, are pushing hard, probably northwesterly. And so it says they went under the lee of Cyprus. All right, a little sailing terminology for you land lovers in Kansas. Um, you, you have two sides of an island when the wind's blowing, and wind is everything when you're sailing, right? Uh, you have the windward side and the lee side. The windward side is where the wind is smashing against the island, and the lee side is where the wind is coming off the island, okay? Windward, lee. This would be very familiar terminology if you're a sailor. So what happens is uh, they're trying to get this way. They can't because of the wind, so they use winds as a crosswind and go under the lee of Cyprus. It says that they pass the region of Cilicia, that's uh, Tarsus, Paul's hometown, and Pamphylia up in here, and they limp their way to Lycia, to Myra. And you're wondering, well, you just said that they couldn't go against those winds. Well, uh, there's a guy who wrote an entire book about the sea voyage of Paul. Uh, his name is James Smith. It's an older book, but incredibly well-researched. Uh, he he was a, a very familiar with maritime realities and, and actually did a... Um, a comparison of ancient diaries and, and logs of ancient sailors to verify whatever Luke was saying and kind of uh, cross-reference it. It's an amazing book, actually, if you're interested in sailing and maritime issues at all. He's just so taken by the fact that Luke is so accurate 
and clearly had spent time on a ship. He uses all the sailing terminologies very easily, but he never goes through to try to explain uh, the, the here and why. And uh, so James Smith, who writes this book, uh, what's the title of it? It's called The Voyage and Shipwreck of St. Paul. He says, Luke clearly had spent a lot of time on a boat. He clearly was familiar with sailing terminology. He theorizes that Luke was probably a, phys- a, a ship's physician earlier in his career because he uses the terms uh, so f- with such familiarity. But he's clearly not a sailor because sailors always describe the why, and Luke doesn't. He just describes the what, uh, like a historian. But he uses all the right terms and, and says it correctly. And so the lee side of Cyprus, they make their way up to um, Myra. Now, when they get there, they board an Alexandrian ship. Who knows where Alexandria is? Egypt, right? North part of Egypt. So why are they boarding an, uh, an Alexandrian ship? Well, if you lived in the first century, you'd know that an Alexandrian ship was a grain ship. It was actually one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, commercial vessel, well, the largest commercial vessel, the only vessel that would have competed was the Roman warships, but even they were probably not quite as big. So this was a large ship. We have a picture of what we think the Alexandrian ship would have looked like. Uh, it's probably along those lines. We don't actually have a, a, a photograph or anything, obviously, from 2,000 years ago, but that's generally what it's going to look like. You see the, uh, they steer with two paddles that come out of the back, and uh, that, that's, that's generally what you're talking about. But it's, it's a large ship. Um, if they're going to get on that ship, it's probably one of the safest ships that you could, you could get on. And uh, they're going to use that to make their way because this ship is bound for Italy. They're going to try to stay on that ship the whole way. Now, let's go back to the map for a second. They're right here when they board the Alexander ship. And they've got the prevailing northwest winds, very common for the Mediterranean this time of the year. And so they're using those winds uh, that are generated from land. That's what Smith says. There's usually winds coming off land when you get close to land. They're using that to limp along slowly to Snida. But then when you get here, if you get out into the open sea, uh, you've got nothing working for you. So they would have liked to go this way. They're not going to be able to. They're going to use the northwest winds as a crosswind, go down to Crete. This is an island called Crete. And there is Salome. It says we took the lee side of Salome, which once again confirms the northwest wind. And they tuck up underneath it and use those uh, winds coming off land to limp along to a place called Fair Havens. Now, if you go to Crete today, there is no Fair Havens. Uh, if there is, it's a tourist thing because uh, there's actually not a port to the south side of Crete anymore. You can see where it once was, but it's now all silted in because there's a mountain creek that's been running into that thing for 2,000 years. Uh, if you've ever been to Ephesus, how many of you ever been to Ephesus? If you've been into Turkey or one of those tours, Ephesus is a wonderful, famous city that once was a port city, but now it's two miles away from the ocean because of the silting process. So that's what's happened here. But it was once a, a small port, and um, it was too small, apparently, to, to winter there. And uh, so Paul is uh, kind of sizing up the situation here. And the thing you should know about Paul, just from, you know, if, if you've been tracking with us through Acts, like, if it's possible to walk, he'll walk instead of taking a boat. I mean, I don't think Paul enjoyed the sea at all. Now you're getting here towards the end of the, the fall, and Paul's like, this is not looking good. I'm not, a, I'm not comfortable with the situation. And Paul being Paul, he just speaks up. So let's see what he says here in verse 9. Luke writes, Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury, much loss, not only of cargo in the ship, but also of our lives. All right. Uh, According to the historian Josephus, Luke's reference to the fast would have pointed to uh, the Day of Atonement, which places us in late September, early October. All right. So this is... This is like the last time that you should be sailing. Like, you need to get done, and you need to figure out where you're going to winter. Because as soon as winter comes in the ancient world, you did not sail. You just didn't get out there at all. And so Paul's feeling a little bit of anxiety. He foresees the disaster that seems to be looming if they keep sailing. And, of course, he speaks up because he's Paul, right? Leaders lead. They're going to speak up regardless of whether they're the prisoner or not. And Paul is used to people uh, giving some weight to his opinion and what he thinks. 
And it's pretty obvious that the ship's captain and a Roman centurion don't care at all what a prisoner says. <laughs> and, uh, so we read in verse 11, But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. Shocker, right? Going on, Luke writes, And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest to spend the winter there. Throw the map back up. This is just a short little jog. All they want to do is take a short little jog from Fair Havens up to Phoenix, and then they're just going to lock and load for the winter. They're going to, you know, throw the anchors. They'll move the ship, depending upon where the storms come from. Because it faces northwest and southwest, that gives you a lot of options to hide when the bad winds come. Um, they're not going to get to Phoenix. But that's what they're going to try to do. This is the Gilligan's Island part of, uh, of this journey. Things are going to turn south. So let's pick up the story there, beginning with verse 13. Now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon, a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Kata, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear and thus were driven along. All right, quite a bit happens here. Let's put the map back up there. So what's going to happen is they're going to just try to take a short jog from Fair Havens to Phoenix. They get out here. I wish this was blowing up. You could see it better. But they get out here. Actually, can we go to the next slide, to Claudius, to that, to that slide? And uh, we'll, we'll show you. So, no, oh, that was right. Go back. Okay. So here's Phoenix, Fair Havens down here. And they're, they're sent out on a south wind, which is perfect. And they're like, oh, this is going to be cake. Not like south wind. Uh, they're going to make their way to Phoenix. And they get off of this point, and they're out here in the open sea, and then the, the wind shifts. How many, now, this happens to us in the fall here in Kansas, right? How many of you, you've been out there in the backyard, it's been a nice day, you're out there cutting grass, and all of a sudden the wind shifts directions, and it drops 30 degrees in an hour. And it's howling, you're like, oh, here comes winter, Right? Well, that, that's what's happening. It's that time of the year. It's hurricane season, right? When you're September, October, if you're around the ocean, and they don't have radars, they don't have meteorologists telling them, hey, there's a storm brewing up in the Mediterranean. And so this thing just blindsides them. And there's a lot of ancient uh, maritime logs and diaries that talk about, you know, these fierce winds that, that come upon you quite suddenly. And that's what happens here. And they are just... Uh, they're subject to it. I mean, they try to fight it, to try to make their way to Phoenix. There's no way they compete against that prevailing gale from the northeast. And so uh, the text says that they just turn the boat and they give way to it. Uh, now, let's go back to that slide of Claudius for just a second. Um, when, they, when they come down, uh, they're now being pushed north, uh, from the northeast. They're going southwest, and they're going to swing underneath here under Cotta. And they have just, you know, an hour or so. And while they're there, these expert Egyptian sailors, I mean, these guys were studs to do what they did back here in the ancient world. But what it says is they secured the ship's boat. The ship's boat would have been a small boat. They would have lowered over with ropes to do land excursions, so the big ship would have stayed anchored in deep water. Well, what we can see here is they, they thought this was going to be a cakewalk to go from Fair Havens up to Phoenix. They were dragging it behind them. They were just towing the ship's boat behind them. And then... All heck broke loose, right? And now they're getting pushed by these gale force winds. Well, that boat is slashed around back behind them, trying to, you know, probably making navigation terrible. They're probably thinking they're going to lose a ship's boat. So when they come to this tiny little island of Clauda, they slip behind it. They manage to get that boat up. And then it said that they secured, uh, they secured the supports to undergird the ship. Uh, James Smith talks about in the ancient world, 
the, all those ships were made of wood. And so if you got into high seas and storms, that ship could literally just be battered to pieces. And so they would take straps or chains, and the crew would throw them up over the bow and over the stern, and they would work to get those things up underneath the ship, and they would pull them together and crank them and make it as tight as possible to keep that ship from breaking apart. So once again, Luke doesn't give us any explanation. He just says this is what they did. They hosted the, 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 ship, um, the ship's boat, and they supported it uh, to undergird the ship. That was standard practice in the ancient world. And then it says that they feared that they would run aground on the Sirtis. Uh, we'll throw a map of the Sirtis up here. This is the northern tip of Africa, uh, what would be currently modern-day Libya. And this area called the, the Lesser Serpents, Greater Service, they're, they're on this track coming this way uh, from, from the northeast to the southwest. They're heading right here. And this whole area famously is super shallow. You can almost see if you have, like, bionic eyes, uh, the rise of super shallow water that comes up in here. And these uh, sandbars were covered with weeds. And so there were uh, several of, of Luke's contemporaries who wrote about this. Uh, the Greek historian Strabo and the rhetorician Deo Chrysostom uh, both talked about the fact that the Sirtis had long, shallow sandbars covered with seaweed that stretched out miles from shore. So a huge Alexandrian ship is going to draft a lot of water. If it gets plowed into that with this northeast gale, you know, it's just bad, bad, and worse, right? I mean, either the storm's going to beat them to death and bust the ship apart. They're going to get stuck so far out there, they're going to starve to death before anybody can help them. Or by some chance, if they manage to navigate through it and you get into that port of the Sirtis, you could never get out and you're going to get bashed against the rocks because the whole Libyan coast is, is guarded by rocks. So they know it is certain disaster if they end up in the Sirtis. So they lower the gear, which means they're going to pull all the sails down. They're going to try to go as slow as possible. You know, if you have sails up, that's just helping that thing shoot southwest. And they're going to use those oars uh, to try to take a tack and push to where they're going west as much as they can. So that's uh, their situation. It's, it's dire, to say the least. And... Um, so let's see what happens next. Verse 18, Luke continues. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, <clears throat> and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Now, you know, you have to use your imaginations. But I just want you to put yourself on that boat. This, this is a horrifying situation. Uh, I, I don't know if you can imagine this. I, I can kind of because I have been in high seas in an inappropriately small boat. And it is a horrifying experience. You know, my dad was in the Navy. He was on the USS Enterprise, which is a massive aircraft carrier. And he said, you're never in a big enough boat on the ocean. Uh, you get into the wrong set of circumstances, you know, you, you can end up with 100-foot waves, and even an aircraft carrier does not feel safe. This was not an aircraft carrier. And th this is a horrible storm. You know, we'll see that it goes on for weeks, because when you're in a storm in a sailboat, the, the storm doesn't push you out, it sucks you in. And so you're just traveling along with the storm. That's why it goes on for days and days and days. And this ship is taking on water, clearly. That's why they're throwing everything overboard. They're throwing the cargo, even the tackle. They're just throwing everything, trying to lighten the ship. They've done what they can do. There's no sight of hope. There's, there's, no, there's no end in sight. They haven't even seen the stars or the sun for days. You have a veteran crew of Egyptian sailors on one of the largest ships in the ancient world, and they have abandoned all hope. You know, if you've ever been in a situation like this, uh, it's, it's a horrifying deal to think you're going to die. And that's where everybody is, except for one. Because as we know from Scripture, there is one who has authority over the sea, and he has made his will known to the Apostle Paul. And now Paul's going to stand up in the most dire moment, and he's going to speak hope. Listen to what he says, verse 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, classic Paul, you should have listened to me. 
You should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart. For I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. All right. Now, here's what you have to remember. In in the first century world, if you're a sailor, if you're really anybody, what happens at sea dictates what God thinks of you or the gods, right? So right now, with a storm that is unrelenting, with a ship that's filling with water, with just the most horrible set of circumstances, and everyone has abandoned hope. Here's what every other person, every other non-Christian is thinking on that boat. The gods hate us. The gods are angry with us. These, this is the punishment. This is justice coming after us to destroy us for, for the evil things that we've done. And they, they have no concept that there might be a God who is not angry with them, who sees them in the midst of their circumstances, and who has a plan. When Paul stands up and brings hope in this darkest moment, it is the most counterintuitive, radical thing, because there is no hope in terms of what they can see. There, there's, no, there's no sun, there's, there's no port. So even before the circumstances change, Paul claims the revelation of God that all is not lost, that God is there, that he has a plan, and that there is hope in the midst of the circumstance. This is so counterintuitive. Uh, One of my research assistant friends who happens to be sitting here today sent this to me. He said, uh, Antiphon in On the Murder of Herodes argues for Helos' innocence on the grounds that all of Helos' sea voyages worked out well for him and everyone who traveled with him, right? So if you're guilty, you drown at sea. If you're innocent, you survive. Another piece of literature called The Mist uh, and Docides answers a charge of impiety by relating a winter sea voyage where he survived uh, pirate-infested waters. And in his conclusion, this is the ancient mentality. The dangers of a trial are to be regarded as the work of man and the dangers of the sea as the work of God. Right? So this is the context that Paul is speaking into where everyone thinks the work of God is we're going to be destroyed because the sea is about to swallow us up. Paul stands up and says it's, it doesn't work that way. The God I belong to, the God that I worship has spoken and there is hope. It's amazing. Church, I want to ask you a question. How often do our lives and the lives of the people that we live with, that we walk with, how often do they end up looking like a shipwreck waiting to happen? It doesn't take much. It takes one phone call takes one diagnosis, one scan at the doctor's office. It takes one lapsed moment of attention on the highway, and you're right there. You were wracked by a sea and a storm that you're pretty sure is never going to end, and all hope is lost. But for those who believe, for those who have faith, for those who belong to God and worship him, listen, there is always hope. There is always hope. God has a plan for our lives. God has a purpose. God is sovereign. And no storm, no threat, no piece of news, no evil of any kind, not even death, can separate us from his perfect goodness and love. There is always hope. And sometimes, if you're traveling beside people who have given up hope, the very best thing you can do is what Paul does right here, and it is to speak a word of hope based upon the revelation of God that he sees us, that he loves us, that he's not angry with us, and that he is a God who delights to save. You know, Paul was not in the appropriate position. He was a prisoner. He was the lowest esteemed on that ship, and yet he was the captain of hope. He stood up when everyone else was despairing. And I can't help but wonder if that wasn't part of the plan, because Luke gets to record a moment of courage A moment of faithfulness that is just so radically counterintuitive. It is so mind-blowing. 
And it is exactly, by the way, exactly the kind of leadership that the world needs from people who know Jesus. Because no matter where you're going to go, you're going to be entering into somebody's storm. You're going to be in that storm with them. And it is your obligation, it is your privilege to be able to stand up and speak when everything seems lost and say, ah, there's still hope. Not all hope is lost. God is not angry. He is there. He is a God who delights to save. You know, some of you have had a rough summer. You've incurred loss. You're already dealing with the bad news of your cancer. You're in a situation that you didn't ask for, or you're walking with people in those situations. Many of us, sometimes those storms are our own doing. You know, Paul's like, well, this kind of happened because you didn't listen. A lot of us don't listen, and a lot of us end up in storms that we probably didn't need to be in, but we made mistakes, and now we're going to deal with it. You know, one of the things that's kind of cool and just really real about the story is the ship's going to wreck. God's not going to supernaturally going to reach down and pull that ship off and just place it over there in Italy. This ship is going to wreck. But not all will be lost because God's going to meet them in that shipwreck. They're going to end up on an island they never thought they were going to be on. They're going to spend months there. God's going to meet them there. There's whole schedules going to be put out of whack, and this is not the way that they had planned it. And it's going to, it's going to look like it worked for God's schedule perfectly. Shipwreck is not the end. Your life may not turn out the way you thought it was going to, but there's still hope. God redeems shipwrecks. God makes beautiful things out of broken things. This is the gospel. God is not angry with you. So, church, if you're in need of saving, you call upon the name of the one who saves, the name of Jesus Christ, and you say, Lord, I need you to save me. And he will. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this traumatic story of lost at sea of battered ships, of apparent hopelessness, of mistakes that get multiplied and lead not only those who made decisions, but all those in the boat with them to suffer. Lord, we can find ourselves in this story. But more importantly is where we find you. You are a God who is sovereign, who has a plan for every human life, and your plan will not be thwarted by any storm. And so we pray that you increase our faith That when we find ourselves in those storms and walking in the storms of others, that we might be those who would boldly stand and say, God said. And it's going to be okay. There is still hope. And for those, Lord, who are struggling today, I just pray that you would minister to their spirit. That they would understand that you brought them here today. That they might not lose hope. That they might continue on clinging to what you have said. Because it is true. You are a God who delights in saving. Lord, minister to us in all the ways that we need and send us out into that sea with courage. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.